Pastor Troy Edwards from Vindicating God Ministries. And um, we're going to continue in our lessons called God Sent It, which is a series of five videos dealing with some of the language in the Bible. And um, basically what we're going to be talking about is how to understand or understanding what the Bible means when it says that God sent sickness, disaster, evil spirits, deception, and things of that nature. You know, um, a lot of people read the Bible and they read such statements, you know, where it talks about God sending sickness, disease, um, deception, evil spirits, and sadly, some people have become atheists. They don't, they rejected the God of the Bible. And then others who may remain Christians become somewhat fatalistic in their theology and their understanding of God. And when um, they're confronted with sickness, disaster, and things of that nature, they have a case Sarah Sarah attitude that says, well, um, this, was will, this is the will of God, so um, my mind will accept it. <clears throat> and a lot of people won't fight against it. They won't take the word of God and stand against um, attacks of the devil because they just believe that these things are coming from God. And sadly, it's because they don't understand the language of the Bible. And so hopefully through these lessons, we can help you to understand that language and we can um, move you away from fatalistic ideology or even a demented or distorted understanding of God and you will see God for who he truly is which is the loving, kind God presented to us by our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And in this lesson, we want to talk about how um, the Bible talks about how God is said to send his, send his people's enemies against them. Um, let's start off with a quote by Edward Bird that we looked at in our last lesson. And we'll probably be looking at it in every one of our lessons. And Edward Bird says, or pray, take notice, God has said in scripture to sin what he can, but doth not hinder from being sent. I believe that if we grasp this understanding of the um, scriptures as presented to us by Edward Bird, then it will alleviate a whole lot of confusion, a whole lot of frustration, and um, a whole lot of misunderstanding about what the Bible is actually teaching when it says things that like God sent sickness or he sent the pestilence or he sent um, snakes to, and serpents to um, bite his people and he sent deception or sent the delusion or sent evil spirits, um, we will truly begin to grasp that if we take um, Edward Bird's statement and apply it to um, our understanding of scripture. And we believe that um, what we've been teaching you, or, or have, have we laid out the foundation in the last lesson, that um, the Bible itself fully supports this, and the original languages in the Bible fully support this based on some of the experts that we've quoted. Um, let's start off with one of the scriptures that we looked at in our last lesson. We looked at two scriptures, or at least we built the foundation on two scriptures in our last lesson. We're just going to look at one of them today. The last lesson we looked at Deuteronomy 28, 20, which talks about how God will send cursing, rebuke, vexation, and things of that nature. And we also looked at Deuteronomy 28, 48. And since we're dealing with, in this lesson with the idea that God actually sends enemies against Israel, then, um, Deuteronomy 28 48 is a good foundation to start off with and God says here based on their disobedience this is one of the many curses outlined in Deuteronomy 28 um, as a result of the people disobeying God and he says therefore shalt thou serve thine enemies Listen to this, which the Lord shall send against thee in hunger and in thirst and in nakedness and in want of all things. And he shall put a yoke of iron upon thy neck 
until he have destroyed thee. Now we looked in um, in the last lesson. We looked at the word sin, and we found out that it's from the Hebrew word shalat, which um, basically means to loosen, let go, to allow, permit, and um, and we saw that. Um, this passage, if we interpret it properly, based on um, the foundation, uh, foundational idea presented to us by Edward Byrd, and based on um, how the Hebrew word shalak can be rendered, then we can interpret this passage quite differently, and it'll give us a better understanding of what God is actually trying to say. Um, Jack, Dr. Jack Blanco, and his the clear word, um, which is a paraphrase of the scriptures, I think he did it the best. He got it, I think he got it right when he um, paraphrased this passage the way he did. Let's look at that. Jack, Dr. Jack Blanco, in his paraphrase, renders the passage this way. So the Lord will let your enemies come against you and take you captive. You will be hungry, thirsty, miserable, Poor and half naked and they won't care so I believe dr. Jack Blanco got this one right because God um, is always protecting his people and that's what we need to understand when we're in obedience to God God protects us and that's what he was trying to um, relate to Israel God was the one protecting them from the protecting these people from their enemies and as long as they remain in obedience to God, God will continue to protect them. Um, what they, what we need to understand is that when God is said to send their enemies against them, it was not that he was using supernatural power to um, influence their enemies. He was basically um, protecting them from the enemies, holding the enemies back either by his own power, by angelic intervention. And it was when they continued to disobey God, worship other gods, push God away, that God would finally have to leave them. And when he left them, of course, his supernatural presence and protection went away from them. And then um, their enemies had... Um, was, a, was able to go in and to attack them. And God took full responsibility for what happened. Now, we need to understand that, you know, um, these passages, when, when they say that God has sent, or that he sent, you know, these, these types of um, punishment, especially something that's destructive, that um, they can be, it can be understood differently by either comparing them with other Bible versions, interpreting that word sin in this um, permit, more permissive sense, or um, comparing scripture with scripture. And we did that in the last lesson. We, we, we did about, we did all three of them. We used all three of those principles rather. And we're going to use all three of those principles again in this lesson. Um, but let me first point out that the Bible is its best interpreter. I, I like to say it this way, the best dictionary, the best Bible dictionary is the Bible. The best commentary on the Bible is the Bible. Now you can look in back of me and you can see that we've got a, uh, you can see I got a lot of books back here. I mean, I got shelves and everything's not even in your view on this camera. But I got all kinds of books back here. I'm, an, I'm a very avid reader. I read a lot. Um, and in Back here, you know, I got a number of um, Bible commentaries and a few dictionaries, and I utilize them. But um, I found out that the best commentary on the Bible and the best dictionary that defines Scripture properly and defines words in the Scripture pro properly is the Bible itself. And so, you know, when you compare um, Scriptures with the Scriptures, you get a better understanding of what certain scriptures that are confusing will say. I like to say it this way because sometimes you got people, especially those who are agnostic or atheists, and they like to say, well, you know, the Bible has too many contradictions. No, the Bible doesn't have any contradictions. The Bible has 
explanations. And um, I should have put that up on one of my slides, but you need to write that down. The Bible doesn't have contradictions. It has explanations. And, you know, and, we, and I put up an example here. You know, for example, you know, the Bible tells us that God sent the Chaldeans and other enemies against his people. And we reference 2 Kings 24 too. The Chaldeans were the Babylonians, um, primarily in, in um, certain periods. It was led by King Nebuchadnezzar. Um, you can read a lot about that in the book of Daniel. Um, now, it says that God, he sent the Chaldeans against his people. But then when you read other passages of scripture, it's written, it, you understand it more in a permissive sense. You see that it's, um, it was more about God removing his protection and then giving the people into the hands of their enemies. And so um, when you read that God sent his enemies against his people, we need to understand it more from a permissive sense that he allowed it because he could no longer protect his people because of the way they were treating him and the way they were pushing him away in the first place. Now, let's look at um, some examples of how we can interpret the scriptures to understand it better. Um, we're going to start off by comparing um, translations. You know, most most people still use the King James Version of the Bible. You know, I like I use it because from the preach and teach because still a lot of people have that. Even though a lot of my friends are using, they have established in their churches to use um, more modern translations. And maybe one day we our church might go to that point. Um, but right now, most people still deal with the King James Version. And so we're going to look at the King James Version. And then we're going to look at some more modern translations that um, help us to render some of these passages in a more permissive sense and also helping us to see that God is not the destructive, vindictive, egotistical being that some people paint him to be. Um, Jeremiah 25 9 God says, Behold, I will sin and take all the families of the north, saith the Lord, Nebuchadrezzar, the king of Babylon, my servant, and will bring them against this land and against the inhabitants thereof, and against all these nations round about, and will utterly destroy them, and make them an astonishment, and an hissing, and perpetual desolations. Hmm. It's pretty tough reading, ain't it? Um, God says he's going to do all that. But let's look at uh, the contemporary English version, and see how it um, renders this passage. Now the CV says, And now I will let you be attacked by nations from the north, and especially by my servant King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylonia. And you and other, na other nearby nations will be destroyed and left in ruins forever. Everyone who sees what has happened will be shocked, but they will make fun of you. So here the CEV, or the Contemporary English Version, Instead of using the word sin, it uses the word let. And that indicates more fully that God is removing his protection from the people. And he's allowing Nebuchadnezzar to um, destroy the people. And let's look at another passage and compare it to the CEV that deals with this um, same subject. Now, in... Um, 2 Kings 15.37, in the King James Version, it says, In those days the Lord began to sin against Judah, Rezin, or Rezin, the king of Syria, and Pekah, the son of Remelia. Um, the CEV says, During his rule, the Lord let King Rezin, or Rezin, of Syria, and King Pekah of Israel start attacking Judah. So, um, so here we see that God is not necessarily using divine power to, mo to motivate or influence these kings to attack his people. He's simply saying, hey, 
you know what? Y'all don't want me around. I will leave. And when that happens, that means I have no other choice but to let all these nations that's always already been wanting to destroy you. I have no other choice now but to let it happen. And so basically we need to understand this in more of a permissive sense. We need to see it not as God's fault, but as the people who push God away. I mean, it's foolish to push away the very person who can keep you safe and protect you and provide for you. But a lot of people do it because they um, find that false the worship of false gods is more appealing because there's more sensuality and more fleshly um, delight in such things. And we need to also understand that there are a number of places in scripture where God says that he will personally send the sword or his or enemy armies upon his people for their rebellion. And so let's um, we we cited a number of them down here. We got some references, but we're going to look at a couple of examples. And in Jeremiah 29, 17. Um, it says, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Behold, I will send upon them the sword, the famine, and the pestilence, and will make them like foul figs that cannot be eaten. They are so evil. See, God's people became so evil that God said that he was going to send all that stuff on them. That's, um, again, that's pretty rough, you know, because even though they were evil, this would make God appear to be vindictive and mean and nasty. You know, he tells us not to take vengeance on people, but yet it looks like that's exactly what he's doing. If we don't learn to properly define the language. And so, thankfully, we have other translations that help us with that. In the New Revised Standard Version, and I need to point out the fact that a lot of people don't care for more modern translations like the Contemporary English Version, the Easy to Read Version, and other versions of that nature. And they like what they call the more um, standard versions, you know, such as the Revised Standard Version. And yet, the Revised Standard, the New Revised Standard Version still helps us out here in its interpretation or translation of Jeremiah 29, 17. It says, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, I am going to let loose on them sword, famine, and pestilence, and I will make them like rotten figs that are so bad that they cannot be eaten. So instead of saying I'm going to send on them the sword, the famine, and the pestilence or sickness, the Revised Standard, or the New Revised Standard Version, rather, tells us he's going to let loose, actually interpreting the um, word sin, which in the Hebrew is shellac, interpreting that word in the more literal sense, or rather the more permissive sense. Let's look at some other examples. Jeremiah 15, 9. It says, She that hath borne seven languages, she hath given up the ghost. Her son is gone down while it was yet day. She hath been ashamed and confounded. And the residue of them will I deliver to the sword before their enemies, saith the Lord. Now notice, here is, um, we, can compare, we are comparing scripture with scripture. And we see that instead of sending the sword, uh, Jeremiah 15 9 says that he will deliver to the sword and that comes from the Hebrew word Nathan which means to allow or permit another one Jeremiah 18 21 therefore deliver up their children to the famine and pour out their blood by the force of the sword and let their wives be bereaved of their children and be widows and let their men be put to death let their young men be slain by the sword in battle. Now these are coming directly from the King James Version. See, this is what I was telling you earlier. You can actually interpret the scripture with the scripture. Um, we've compared other translations, but those who may be doubtful about whether 
those are um, good or valid or accurate translations, no problem. Right there within your um, your King James Version Bible, you still have the um, definition or the interpretation of what God is actually saying when he says that he's going to send the sword, the famine, the pestilence. He said he means that he's going to deliver or deliver up. Let's look at a couple more. In Jeremiah 25 31 it says, A noise shall come even to the ends of the earth. For the Lord hath a controversy with the nations. He will plead with all flesh. He will give them that are wicked to the sword, saith the Lord. So he's going to give them, not, not sin, but he's going to give them over to it. Let's look at Micah 6.14. Thou shalt eat, but not be satisfied. And thy casting sh down shall be in the midst of thee. And thou shalt take hold, but shall not deliver. And that which thou deliverest will I give up to the sword. So instead of um, God saying, I'm going to send the sword, here he says, I'm going to give you up to the sword. So here again, we got more scripture that helps us to interpret the other scriptures that says that God is going to send these things. In other words, when he says, I'm going to send, he really means, I'm just going to give you over to it. I'm no longer going to protect you from it. More examples. Ezra 9, 7. Since the days of our fathers have we been in a great trespass unto this, unto this day, and for our iniquities have we, our kings and our priests, been delivered into the hand of the kings of the land, to the sword, to captivity, and to a spoil, and to confusion of face, as it is this day. So again, they were delivered. And, um, and then Ezekiel 32.20, we look at that one. It says, They shall fall in the midst of them that are slain by the sword. She is delivered to the sword. Draw her and all her multitudes. In other words, God gives her up. Talking about Israel. So, sin, when it says that God sent the sword, the famine, the sickness, other passages tell us that that can be understood in a more permissive sense that God only delivered or gave them up to these things when he removed his hand of protection from them because they continued to push him away by their disobedience and their, their rejection of him, their forsaking him and their desire to worship um, other gods, the gods of the heathen nations around them. Now, the, uh, as we told you over earlier that the um, words deliver and give or to give up or to give over is from the Hebrew word Nathan and I like the way John Hale Murray he um, gives us the interpretation or uh, the definition rather of that word Nathan says but the words here used signify only a permission of the things spoken of and not the very doing of them the Hebrew word Nathan means to suffer or permit so when you see the words deliver or give up or give give over to, that's exactly what it's talking about as God simply permitting or allowing the circumstances to come upon him. In this case, or in our present study, he allows the sword or enemy armies to um, attack and destroy his people because they don't want him around. So he had, he's left with no other choice but to allow it. Now, we can find an even greater understanding of this through what I like to call the Yeshua revelation. Because Jesus himself, <laughs> in a um, more difficult statement, or more challenging, one of Jesus' more challenging statements, you know, Jesus has some hard sayings, and, um, and you, I have a devotional book that deals with some of them. But in one, one statement, Jesus says that he did not come to bring peace, but a sword. And let's look at that. In Matthew 10, Jesus 
says, Wherefore, therefore, shall confess me before men, him will I confess also before my Father which is in heaven. But whosoever shall deny me before men, him will I also deny before my Father which is in heaven. Now look at verse 34. Think not that I am come to send peace on earth. I came not to send peace, but a sword. Now look at that. Jesus said he came to send a sword. Now let's read on because the context really is going to be very helpful because people only they take they often take Jesus statement out of context and they miss exactly what he's saying. But the context helps us. It says for I am come to set a man at variance against his father and the daughter against her mother and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law and a man's foes shall be they of his own household. He that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me, and he that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. So what is Jesus saying here? Is he saying that, you know, I came here for the express purpose of getting all, all people in their own households mad at each other and trying to destroy each other? Did he say, I'm, I, I, I didn't come here to um, bring peace. I came here to bring a sword. Is that what Jesus is saying? He's going to use supernatural power to cause all of us to be mad at each other? Well, as we understand this, we need to understand the context. Because if we don't understand the context, then we will accuse the Bible of being contradictory. You know, I pointed out some things in the next slide. Um, you know, the fact that the Bible tells us that Jesus is the Prince of Peace. And that and there, in a number of places, especially in the epistles, he is referred to as the God of peace. He and then we read that he is not the author of confusion, but of peace in um, 1 Corinthians 14:33. And then the angels in Luke chapter 2 came to announce his mission was to be peace on earth. Yet Jesus seems to be contradicting that whole thing right there. So if um, we don't understand what Jesus is actually trying to say in Matthew chapter 10, then we will accuse the Bible of being contradictory. But remember what I told you earlier. There is no such thing as contradictions in the Bible. There are only explanations. And let's look at that um, Matthew 10 one more time. So Jesus is saying he did not come to send peace but a sword. But then in verse 35 he talks about how um, people in their own households will go against each other. Fathers against sons and daughters against mothers. Um, Daughter-in-laws against mother-in-laws. Basically what Jesus is saying here is that you and I, when we become Christians, we can't compromise our values. We can't compromise our views. We can't, we, we've got to love Jesus more than we love our own family. A lot of people will give up Jesus for their family. Um, girlfriends will give up Jesus for their boyfriends. and Husbands will give up Jesus because they love their wives more. Um, Jesus says, you got to love me more than everybody. And so that's what he's talking about here. He's telling us that um, because of our commitment to him, it will probably cause division amongst those who want nothing to do with Jesus. And... Thankfully, you know, I found a number of commentaries that um, that actually point this truth out. You know, John Forster in his um, book, The Gospel Narrative According to the Authorized Text of the Evangelist, writes, This is a forcible but not unusual idiom, a mode of expression by which the foreseen consequence of any measure is represented as the purpose for which that measure was adopted. In other words, what um, Brother Forster is telling us here is that, you know, there the idiom or, you know, the Hebrews had a number of idiomat idiomatic expressions, and you know, it's kind of like in our day, um, at least those of us in the black community, sometimes we use the word bad to express something good. You know, like somebody um, can shoot the shoot a basketball and we say, man, that dude is bad. 
I mean, look how look how he just shoot them hoops. Um, but we really mean that he's very good at playing basketball. And so that's what this man is talking about here. He said this is an idiom. Jesus is not literally saying he's going to send the sword. He's saying that because of our commitment to him, that is going to obviously cause some problems within our families and households. And so he takes responsibility for that happening. And see, when you understand what Jesus is saying here, you will understand the Old Testament also when it talks about how God says that he will send the sword, the famine, the pestilence. But let's look at another um, commentary on this. Daniel Baggett, in, in his book, An Exp Exposition of the Gospel According to St. Matthew, writes, We are not, however, to suppose that Jesus here represents himself as the immediate promoter of discord and dissension amongst men. His language is only a strong mode of expressing the certainty of an anticipated result by representing it as the very object contemplated by the course of conduct which ultimately leads to it, but which leads to that result not in consequence of any immediate arrangement or direct agency on the Savior's part, but because the enmity of men instigated by the power of Satan has risen against his church so as to produce such results. So if you understand what um, Daniel Baggett is saying, he's saying that Jesus is simply taking responsibility for what happens when we have unwavering, undying commitment to him despite any objections that any of our family members or friends or society has concerning our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And Jesus, because he's not going to lower the standard, he has to take responsibility for the results that come from our um, uncompromising commitment to him. And let's look at one more um, commentary on this. And one of my favorite authors, Thomas Jackson, in his book, The Providence of God, viewed in the light of Holy Scripture, he writes this. The meaning certainly is not that Christ, designedly or by any direction, exertion of his power, stimulates the passions of bad men, causing them to hate and persecute the servants, and even to slay them with the sword, but that the introduction of his religion in the states and families would be followed by these results, ungodly children persecuting their Christian parents, and ungodly parents persecuting their godly children, though their own innate hatred of spiritual religion and civil rulers, hostile to the truth, subjecting the followers of Christ to imprisonment and to martyrdom. You know, in America, we don't have that as much. You know, you might get picked on or teased by family members. But in other nations, man, it's tough to be a Christian. You lose, you, you can lose your family. You could possibly lose your life. Your own family members are willing to kill you, especially if you defect from another um, religion such as Islam. You know, Christianity is not a religion. It's a relationship with a person. But, you know, if you defect from Islam or Hinduism or things of that nature, you get severely persecuted even by your own family members. And you could be deprived of financial assistance and, and things of that nature. And so these are not coming from God. He's not the one causing these things to happen. This is Satan. Satan hates God. He hates Christianity. It, Jesus Christ defeated him and Every time uh, someone gets born again, it's a reminder to Satan that he's been beaten and he no longer owns us. And so, of course, he's going to um, react violently and he's going to use those who still um, serve him, whether they know, they know they're serving him or not, against um, God's people. And so that's what Jesus is talking about there. Jesus is going to basically allow this to happen and for our own good. And so, um, therefore, we have to understand that um, persecution is inevitable, but it's not Jesus making it happen. But we need to um, be com fully and thoroughly committed to our Lord. Now, we need to understand that Satan 
is actually the evil spirit behind all the attacks, all the enemy attacks that Israel experienced. See, God often took responsibility for what the devil was doing. And, you know, although Satan is not totally absent from the Old Testament, you know, his face is not always shown. And the book of Job helps us to understand this even more, how um, God often took responsibility for the work that Satan was doing. And so in Job chapter 1, you know, I would encourage you to read the whole um, chapter if you haven't read the book of Job yet. R at least read chapters 1 through 3 and then 42. Um, and you'll get a better understanding of how God is often said to do that which he only allowed or permitted. But in Job chapter 1, let's look at verses 12 and 17. It says, And the Lord said unto Satan, Behold, all that he hath is in thy power, only upon himself. Put not forth thine hand. So Satan went forth from the presence of the Lord. While he was yet speaking, there came also another and said, the Chaldeans made out three bands, and fell upon the camels, and have carried them away, yea, and slain the servants with the edge of the sword. And I only am escaped alone to tell thee. So Satan always lets somebody escape the, so that he can become the messenger to um, let people know, let the saints know what he did to them. But um, here we see that Satan was behind the Chaldean attack against Job and the destruction of Job's property and servants. So, you know, everywhere in the Bible where we read that God sent the sword against Israel, we need to see that Satan was the, really the influence behind these attacks. Um, he is the, you know, First John chapter 5 verse 19 says that the whole world is under his sway or under his control he he holds influence over men you know second corinthians chapter 4 verse 4 says he blinds the minds of men um ephesians chapter 2 says that we all were once the children of disobedience that we went the course of the prince of the power of the air so he is the one influencing evil men to do what they do. So what hap usually what happens is um, when we read through the Bible and we find that Israel just continued to sin and God would send prophet after prophet to try to turn them back. You know that, you see, sometimes we fail to read how merciful God is in, that, in those scriptures. How he's constantly trying to win his people back. Constantly trying to keep them protected despite how they were acting and the Bible talks about how he rose up early in the morning sending his prophets to try to, to um, persuade the people to turn back to him and so finally at a certain point God has to say alright you know what y'all want to keep serving Satan there's nothing else I can do goodbye and once God leaves then Satan has full authority to go after and use his evil men to attack um, God's people and so God so Satan well, not God was behind these attacks though God often took credit for or not I won't say credit I'd rather say responsibility for it when he says that he sent these things but understanding that when he said he sent it it means he let it happen now in the Bible um, in Job chapter 2 verse 3 we see how God took responsibility even for the attack um, that Satan had uh, or launched against Job. It's he speaking to Satan, and the Lord said unto Satan, "Has thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and upright man, one that feareth God and escheweth evil, and still he holdeth fast his integrity." Although thou movest me against him to destroy him without cause. You know, you, you got people that say, well, all things happen for a reason. No, not necessarily. God said that there was no reason for these attacks on Job. Yet, 
they happen. And God takes full responsibility as though he did it himself. But then I like the way another um, translation renders this particular passage. In the New Life Version, we read, The Lord said to Satan, Have you thought about my servant Job? For there is no one like him on the earth. He is without blame, a man who is right and good. He fears God and turns away from sin. He still holds to his good ways, even though when I allowed you to go against him and destroy him for no reason. I like that translation for several reasons because, first of all, it lets us know that there was no real reason behind these attacks. You know, a lot of people say, well, you know, God was setting Job up, you know, to test him and stuff like that. There's nothing in the book of Job that teaches that. Um, and But I don't want to get into that right now. But the thing is that here we see, most of all, that God um, allowed you know, Satan to go against him. In other words, God removed his protection from Job for that temporary period of time in order to answer the accusations, the false accusations, by the way, that Job, I mean, that Satan launched against God and Job in front of the um, angelic community of the universe. And so God had to allow this to happen in order to answer these accusations and erase any doubt from the minds of all in the universe concerning God's true love and justice and that he can't be bribed and that there are people that will actually serve God not for what they can get from God but simply because they love God and so that's basically what Job is all about but we see here that God did not instigate these things against Job he did not want them to happen against Job but he did allow them to happen and um, the King James Version usually has God taking full responsibility for it, but the context itself lets us know that Satan, not God, let it happen. God simply removed the hedge and allowed Satan to have his way. Now, I like, again, something Thomas Jackson said, and we're going to end with this statement. It, he said, it is then so common in Holy Scripture to speak of God as actually doing that which he simply permits and does not absolutely hinder men from doing that this may be justly regarded as an idiom of Eastern speech there's that word idiom again and it basically is talking about um, unique like unique ways of saying things um, that is particular to that culture and you we already gave you the illustration from how people in my culture or my background use certain words and they don't really if you uh, if you interpret it literally then you would not fully understand exactly what the person was saying and that's sometimes part of the problem is that we don't interpret the language of God and his book the Bible which it, the Bible is the word of God is the is, is God's written revelation of man but we need to understand the language as it pertains to the western mind because as Thomas Jackson points out the Bible was written by um, Eastern men or as some people call them the ancient Near East and they, they had a different culture than what we have here in the West and if you just give a um, literal translation of it then you won't understand the thought behind what they were actually saying. And quite often, um, you read certain statements where God says he sent this or he's going to send some disastrous event. And if we don't interpret it properly, then we get a wrong picture of God, a negative picture of God. And it either leads to rejection of God or a lifestyle of fatalistic Christianity where we allow Satan to continually beat us up. And we don't fight against it. But when we understand that many of the um, statements in the Bible, especially in the Old Testament, where God is said to have um, sent some disaster, some sickness, some evil spirit, and we understand that that's more permissive, then um, we begin to grasp the truth about God and we get a better picture 
of what he is and what he's actually like. And you see that he truly is the God of the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus said he'd send a sword, but we saw that he did not mean that from, from a literal aspect, but he simply meant that the result of his coming and the result of our commitment would cause issues with our family members. And that's the same idiomatic language being used throughout the Old Testament. So anyway, God bless you. If you are enjoying these lessons, I'd encourage you to visit um, our website for more resources in www.vindicatinggod.org. We've got a, um, a number of um, books you can download absolutely free. We've got um, audio teachings, videos, um, some articles, all these things um, dealing with the character of God and how to better understand this loving, wonderful, kind God that we have and to understand the language of the Bible so that you can read your Bible and actually enjoy it and, um, and not be afraid of the God that you have. Anyway, love you so much. God bless you. Won't you email me um, or if you're on YouTube, um, put something down in the comments. Let, let us know you're watching. Um, tell us what you think. If these videos are helping you, if they're being a blessing to you, we'd really love to know. Anyway, again, I love you. God bless you. See you soon. Bye-bye. If you enjoyed these video teachings, won't you consider downloading a PDF copy of our book, The Lord Sent It, understanding what the Bible means when it says that God sent sickness, disaster, evil spirits, and deception. You can go to www.vindicatinggod.org and you can download a free PDF copy, or if you prefer, like me, to read it in paperback, we have ordering information on the webpage as well. So that's www.vindicatinggod.org. And also, we've got other resources that are either available or becoming available. For example, we have our book, The Permissive Sense. Hints and Helps to Bible Interpretation that Vindicates God's Character of Love. We've got um, another book that will probably be out by the time this video series is um, online, which is Does God Send Natural Disasters? Vindicating God's Character Concerning Accidents and Disasters. You know, when we teach these principles about God um, not being a killer and not being an active destroyer, you know, sometimes the questions come up, you know, well, what about Noah? Well, what about Sodom and Gomorrah? What about um, the plagues that God sent on Egypt? You know, these are valid questions, and we believe that we have provided some biblical answers in this book, and I believe that they will bless you and help you to understand the truth about God's character of love even more. And we've got a number of books that are already available on our webpage that you can order. We have, Does God Engage in Destructive Behavior? This is a study guide for understanding and vindicating God's character. You know, a lot of people um, believe that God is a very destructive God. And we show you that he really is a loving God and how to understand the language in the Bible, especially in the Old Testament, when it talks about God destroying. Um, and you can get that one online as well. You can download it free, a free PDF, or you can get a paperback copy. We also have How, which is a look at God's character in the light of biblical passages that are inconsistent with love. In other words, you find a lot of stuff in the Bible where it talks about God cursing, God um, bringing judgment, and a number of things of that nature. God's wrath. How does he exercise his wrath? How does he... Um, do certain things that people find to be inconsistent with love, how will explain that to you? And you will find out that God is nothing the way that some of our theologians have um, taught. And you will understand the language in the Bible a whole lot better when it talks about um, some of these type of things in relation to God. And then we also have our book, God is said to do that which he only permits. 
in which we try to explain this principle in more detail. Um, there's a difference between that and the permissive sense, but um, you would have we had to wait for the permissive sense to come out before we can really give you that um, explanation. But I think you would enjoy this book. It gives you a principle, uh, a historic, a history, excuse me, of this principle that we've been teaching, and. You will find out that we're not teaching anything new, that this is something that's been taught for centuries. And you'll not only understand the biblical portion of it, but you'll understand how um, many of our church fathers and our Jewish theologians understood this truth that we're giving you in these series of videos, as well as the other books. And finally, we have our book, Does God Send Sickness? Vindicating God's character concerning sickness and disease. Let me tell you right now, the answer is no, he does not. But you need to understand the language in the Bible concerning that. And this book will be very helpful to you. Besides, my handsome, beautiful face is on the cover. So you should buy for at least that. Anyway, God bless you. I love you. Hope you um, are enjoying these teachings. Send me an email. Put a comment on YouTube. Facebook me, twit me, or tweet me. Um, communicate with me. God bless you. Love you so much. Bye-bye.